everyone. Hope you're doing well. It's me, Chris Bennett, your blockchain beard guy. Listen, I wanted to spend a few moments today just talking to you about some lessons we can extract from the world around us about what makes a good blockchain solution or solution design. Now, I know that if you're brand new to blockchain, it can seem kind of overwhelming. All of this is so new and it's such a radically different approach from what we're used to that oftentimes there can be a real tendency to want to discard all of the lessons from the past. And oftentimes this is one of the biggest mistakes that we make, not learning what the new approaches are, um, but discarding old valid approaches or methodologies or lessons that are still perfectly valid in this new and uncharted world that we're exploring with blockchain and other decentralized technologies included in that web 3.0 basket. And so sometimes some of the best lessons that we can learn uh, come from what we perceive to be very old solutions, uh, solutions or approaches that we might not think are applicable to blockchain. And one great example of that is a brand that everyone, uh, I assume, is familiar with, Zippo Lighters. Uh, you probably are familiar with Zippo lighters. Maybe you've used them personally or seen them in the movies. A uh, very, very famous brand of pocket lighters. So what in the world does this very old technology, uh, a design from 1932, uh, have to do with blockchain in the world today? Uh, and what kind of lessons can we learn uh, by looking at the story of Zippo? So I want to dive in and talk about 10 lessons that we can learn from the design of a pocket lighter in 1932 that might help us come up with great blockchain solutions in the year 2021 and beyond. Let's go ahead and dive in and take a look, shall we? So the story behind Zippo is kind of an interesting one. Uh, the founder of Zippo is a man by the name of George Blaisdell. And in the early 1930s, George was playing golf with a friend of his in Bradford, Pennsylvania. And uh, the style at the time uh, for pocket lighters is something that was known as the Austrian lighter or the trench lighter because these were very prevalent in World War I. And this is a great example of a trench lighter. Uh, it's got a little cover on top and you remove the cover. Uh, there's the little spark wheel and uh, cotton underneath that keeps a wick fueled and then the wick ignites and actually uh, this is a very very early example of one of these austrian lighters uh, by the 1930s these lighters also included a little perforated piece of metal called a chimney uh, that helped them resist the wind and so one day uh, george bladell the founder of the company he's playing golf with his friend and he's watching his friend struggle to use his lighter uh, because it takes two hands. You need one hand to remove the cover and the other hand to strike the lighter. And his friend is trying to uh, set down a drink and hold his golf clubs and also work the lighter with two hands. And all of a sudden it occurs to George that this is maybe not the best way to be doing things. Maybe there's a better design. And George had a very simple idea. You see, George was the son of a machinist. Um, and so he learned about machining and metal work. And so he had a very, very simple idea. If we took this design that already existed and we simply put a hinge on it, well, then the lid could flip back. And rather than needing two hands to work your lighter, well, you could simply do that same thing with one hand just by putting that hinge on. Uh, so this was the idea that George had. He created a hinged version of these Austrian or trench lighters. And these first went on sale in 1933 for the whopping price of $1.95 a piece. Um, I think what's amazing is almost 100 years after these lighters first went on sale, you can still purchase them um, in very, very plain vanilla versions for $10 or less. Um, so they have not appreciated that much in price. 
A Zippo lighter is also kind of neat because every single lighter is sold with a guarantee that if it ever breaks, mail it back to Zippo and they will fix it, uh, give it back to you in working condition, absolutely free of charge. Uh, and this is a very, very subtle, but I think very powerful message. What Zippo is selling you is not the lighter. Zippo is selling you a way to make fire. And so if your lighter ever breaks and you're not able to make fire, uh, Zippo has sold you that ability. And so they're going to fix it to make sure that that is an ability that you always have. Um, <clears throat> Well, of course, the real reason that we know Zippo, why that's become such a household name, why you see these lighters and movies and TV shows and sold in stores uh, as collectibles all around the world, uh, largely has to do with World War II. Uh, in 1941, uh, Zippo entered into an agreement with uh, their biggest customer at the time, the United States Army. And a Zippo became standard issue to every GI who was going off to war. And it was this that made the Zippo lighter an iconic part of American culture. Um, years later, in 1958, for purely quality control purposes, Zippo started introducing a date stamp that can be found in the case on the bottom of all their lighters. And this had a very inadvertent and unplanned effect. This date stamp made these lighters collectibles. And now all of a sudden people wanted to have a lighter with the same date stamp as their birth year or the year they graduated from school or got married or had their first child. Um, and this really transformed the lighters from just a utility product to a collectible, to something very interesting and uh, something people were willing to pay a high price for. Uh, Zippo to this day still makes every lighter by hand in Bradford, Pennsylvania, and the company is still family owned and operated. So a great story about a company that has remained true to its principles and been very, very, very successful uh, over the past almost 100 years. Like I said, there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from Zippo's story. In fact, there are 10 big takeaways that we can learn from this story and apply to blockchain solutions that we design and build in the world around us. And this is just one example. Like I said, far too often when radically new technologies or approaches come around, we think because all of this is so new, we need to throw away all of our old knowledge, all of our time-tested principles. But in fact, this is not the case. And oftentimes this can be um, some of the worst or most painful mistakes that we make. So let's talk about these 10 lessons that we can learn from Zippo lighters and how they apply to the world of blockchain. Starting with lesson number one, which is old tools never die. Um, as human beings, we never stop using old tools. Sometimes we like to convince ourselves that we will or that we have, but the truth is we never stop using old tools. And taming fire is a great example of this. Now, depending on the archeological records that you look at, human beings first tamed fire anywhere between 400,000 and 1 million years ago. So at the longer end of that estimate scale, fire is a million year old tool. And you might think to yourself, if a tool has existed for a million years, surely we have thought of every way possible to improve it and optimize it and make that experience better for our users. But oftentimes that's not the case. You see, even though fire is a very old tool, we still haven't moved on from it. We still use it today. And presumably we're gonna to continue to use it in the future. If we look at a more recent example, the automobile largely replaced the horse and buggy as a primary means of transportation. But that doesn't mean that horses and buggies aren't still used today. They absolutely are. They're just not primarily used for personal transportation anymore. So remember, good tools never die. They never go anywhere. And when new tools come along, they never replace old tools. Rather, they complement them. 
And if you've taken our blockchain architecture class, if you've gone through class with me talking about solutions, architecture, and blockchain, you've heard me say this. Blockchain is not a tool that is designed to replace the other tools in your toolbox. It's one designed to complement them. If you go out to the hardware store and you buy a fancy new set of wrenches, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to come home and throw away all your screwdrivers. Wrenches don't replace screwdrivers, they complement them. And we see this in the technology world as well. Uh, when I first started my career many years ago, uh, the IT trend that was most in vogue at the time was going paperless. Uh, replacing paper documents with digital documents. Uh, organizations would take their archive, their library of paper or physical documents and scan them and create digital versions. Because archiving, managing, and maintaining these digital copies was so much easier. And a lot of people said at the time that this paperless technology was going to replace paper. 25 years later, I think all of us still have a lot of paper in our life. Digital documents didn't replace paper. We still live in a world filled with paper, just like email didn't replace faxes. Maybe we don't use physical paper or fax machines quite to the extent that we used to, but to say that technologies have come along and replaced them and they are now gone from the world uh, is its own big misunderstanding. So what does this have to do with blockchain? Well, remember, old tools never die. Blockchain is a very new tool and it's a very new approach. But if you're using blockchain in a solutions design or you're interested in exploring blockchain because you think it's gonna replace an old technology, like a relational database, you're wrong. Blockchain has simply added another tool to our toolbox. And in the coming years and decades, blockchain is going to continue to complement these existing tools and approaches, not replace them or compete with them. And so as you look out in the world around you and you try and figure out <clears throat> where does this blockchain technology really fit in? What can I do with it? What's the right way to be thinking about it? The question you really wanna ask yourself is, what old tools or approaches do you see in the world around you that could use a little revisiting or improvement? In other words, what do you see in the world around you that works and provides value and does what it's supposed to do, but could maybe be a little bit better? Just like George realized that fire wasn't going anywhere, but the experience could be made more convenient simply by adding a hinge to an already existing design. Lesson number two from Zippo, you are rewarded for being clever, not for being smart. And this can be a hard one to remember sometimes because of rule number three, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But think about what Zippo did. Zippo didn't invent the lighter. All they did all George, uh, George Blaisdell's innovation really was, was to add one hinge to an already existing device. All of this already existed. And like I said, the chimney, this little perforated metal piece, uh, which helps make the lighter windproof, already existed on this style of Austrian or trench lighter in the 30s. So literally the only thing that Zippo did was add this very small hinge to the case. They didn't reinvent anything. They made one small improvement. Again, anytime there's radically new technology or radically new approaches or methodologies that accompany that technology, there's an inbuilt tendency for us to want to throw away all of that older institutional knowledge, believing that old lessons don't apply to new paradigms. But that's not the truth. Zippo added one small component to an already existing design that solved a real world problem. Another way to think about this is sometimes subtraction is the better way to get to a desirable end state rather than addition. In other words, 
as technical solution architects, oftentimes we look at a problem space and we say, what can we add to a solution? What can we add to this space to create a better user experience? Can we use more technology? Can we use a greater diversity of technologies? Can we use technologies in a way they're not being used currently? And that's a perfectly way, valid way to think about it. But you also need to challenge yourself to think about, can I improve the problem space through subtraction? Or is addition the only method? Can I take things out of the problem space that result in a better user experience? And the design of a Zippo lighter is a great example of this because for all of those hundreds of thousands of years, all the way up until the 1930s, when George Blaisdell made his first design for the Zippo lighter, fire was a two-handed process. Way back in the day, if you wanted a fire, you had to rub two sticks together or strike a stone and a flint together. These are both two-handed processes. Later came matches, but matches are still a two-handed process. You need one to hold the match and strike it, and the other to hold the matchbook. And even the most modern design at the time in the 1930s, the modern Austrian or trench lighter was still a two-handed affair. You need one hand to hold the lighter and the other hand to remove the cap or the lid. George's innovation wasn't addition, it was subtraction. He realized you don't need two hands to start a fire. You can start a fire with one hand. George solved the problem by subtracting one hand from the equation. That part of the paradigm wasn't needed anymore. So even though parts were added to the design itself, components were removed from the larger paradigm. Remember this. As counterintuitive as it can seem, sometimes subtraction can be greater than addition. So what does this have to do with blockchain? Well, some things to think about. The universe and your customer or end user base overwhelmingly prefer solutions that are clever, not smart. And when we say clever, we mean solutions that are simple and elegant in their design. There is not a lot of complexity that had to be added to the design of a pocket lighter to vastly improve the experience. And this simple and elegant design is preferable to many people over a design which is highly complex and self-congratulatory. In other words, a clever design is always better than a simple one. So again, as you're challenging yourself to look out in the world around you and find areas where blockchain can be used and deployed for the greatest return, to create the greatest delta in end user or customer experience, don't go out and look for things that you can rip down and replace with blockchain. Find something that already works. Find a real problem in the world where a solution exists but could be optimized and ask yourself, do the tools available to me through blockchain give me any sort of ability to add or subtract components that's gonna result in a better user experience? And again, don't forget, especially if you're like me, especially if you come from a technical background, that your end users, your customers, the people who matter the most in this whole process are not going to like your solution because it's smart, because it's overly complex and self-congratulatory. They're going to prefer something that is simple and elegant. So if you're architecting your solutions because you're trying to impress your peers, other engineers or developers or coders or executives or solution architects or project managers, if you're just trying to impress them with the brilliance of your design, that may be a fun activity, but there's a very good chance you're missing the mark that you want to hit. Now, like I said, lesson number two can be a little bit confusing, that you're rewarded for being clever, not smart. Because lesson number three tells us you are remembered and revered for being smart, not clever. 
what George Blaisdell did in the 1930s was very clever. He just added one small hinge to an already existing design. <clears throat> but if you ask most people today about the history of Zippo, most people will tell you Zippo was the company that invented the pocket lighter. That's not true, but they get the credit for doing so because most people in retrospect assume that their groundbreaking idea was something very smart and complex, not something very clever and simple. In fact, one of the things that Zippo is best known for is something that they can't take any credit for whatsoever, and that's the chimney on the lighter. Uh, this piece of perforated metal around the edge that makes this lighter largely impervious to any kind of wind and still usable in a wide range of conditions. Like I said, that little chimney already existed on standard uh, Austrian pocket lighters well before George Blaisdell started his company. But most people today will tell you that a windproof lighter is one of Zippo's biggest legacies. Um, because this product has become such a well-known and such an iconic product, many people want to attribute things to it, to its founders, and to its design that really shouldn't be attributed to them. And this is great for marketing, for getting your product known. Right? If your customers are going to give you credit for something that someone else has done, even if you try and tell them that's not the case, I don't know about you, but that doesn't seem like the worst problem in the world to have. So what does this have to do with blockchain? Well, before you go out and copy someone else's approach, before you look at someone else who's been successful in the market and try and do what they've done, take a step back and make sure you really understand what it is that made them successful. Because if you're just listening to what all the people around you say, you're probably not thinking that that organization or that group or that project was successful for the reasons they really were. If you ask most people what made Zippo lighters successful, you would hear things like they invented the pocket lighter and they designed a windproof lighter. Neither one of those things are true. When you dig in and you look at what actually made Zippo successful, it was something as simple as adding a hinge to an already existing design. If you just took the word of people around you and didn't dig in and do your own research, you would likely come away with a very different conclusion. Because again, in retrospect, we tend to attribute success to being smart, not clever, when in reality, at the time, success is largely gained through cleverness, not through intelligence and complexity. And if you do end up like George Blaisdell, wildly successful in creating an iconic, well-known product, be sure to be honest about your accomplishments. Show those who follow that you don't have to have the most complex or intricate design to be the winner. That oftentimes simplicity comes with a greater bounty than complexity.